happening. Well, listen, everybody, I just want to encourage you. We're beginning a new series. It's Ephesians, one of the greatest books of the Bible, from identity to destiny, from identity to destiny. Can you imagine waking up one morning and having no idea who you are? Can you imagine that? Wake up one morning, you don't know who you are. What happened in 2004, in a dumpster in Burger King in Georgia, there was a guy named Benjamin Kyle who woke up uh, an employee was bringing out garbage in the morning and found this guy. The guy had a couple indentations in his head. He was eaten by ants, and he was in a mess. It brought him to the hospital. And for the next 10 years, he had no idea who he was, where he came from, where he was going. He had no identity. They began to call him um, Burger King Joe. <laughs> Imagine being called Burger King Joe. It's kind of a cool name. No, but seriously, he didn't know who he was. So eventually what happened was uh, they did DNA samples and all that. They found out who he was, and he found out where he lived in the area. He didn't really know where he was, but he went around the town, and he began to find his identity in the community he was implanted with. In other words, he went to his hometown, and he began to know who he was within the community he was located. He got his identity from his community. And I would say a lot of us are the same. We, we, we get our identity from the community. We get our identity from where we grew up. We get our identity from our family. We get our identity for what we do. We get our identity from how we fail and how we succeed, right? We often feel, I am, I am determined by those around me. And in fact, I, I don't know if you recognize this, but our communities around us have a great effect about how we view ourselves. We often uh, compare ourselves to each other, right? We do it all the time. I mean, I have teenagers, and I don't know where this came from, but everywhere around the world, I, there's a couple of things I hear around the world. When I go around the world, I was in India one time. We're driving in this, in this car, in this uh, truck thing, and a little kid's there. He's speaking. He's upset, and he starts speaking Indian. I don't know what he was speaking. And I said, what did he say? He's asking, are we there yet? <laughs> so it's like, okay, any language, any culture. And here's another one. Here's another one, the kids always say. Everyone else is doing it, right? And what do we say as parents? Go ahead, say it. If they jumped off of what? They do that in India too, okay? So yeah, we always say, well, well, who cares what everyone's doing? We often evaluate ourselves based upon those around us, just like that man who, who didn't know who he was, but his community told him who he was. And, and, and this whole book, Ephesians, from identity to destiny, what you think about yourself controls your destiny. Now, I know it sounds like, oh, no, this is one of these, you know, these self-help sermons. No, it's not a self-help sermon. Let, let me say something very clearly. I will quote atheists at times. I will quote scientists at times. I quote different people. You know why? Because all truth is God's truth. If something's true, God's true, right? So if an atheist knows it, it must, if it's true, I'll quote that person. So sometimes I've, I've gotten people sending me emails, Pastor, how could you do that? That person's woke. Uh, well, I, that person had said an accurate statement, so I said it. <laughs> and God's truth, all truth is God's truth. doesn't mean I endorse somebody. Okay, and, and so this is what we see happening is our identity from identity to destiny. Now, I want to share a couple things with you. Your identity leads to your destiny. It really does. What you think about yourself determines how your destiny will come forth. Now, you may think you're the smartest person in the room and you're not. You may think you can sing and you cannot. You may think you're Superman. And can, or, the, or you may think you're Thor, but you're not, right? So you may think you can fly, but you jump off a building, you'll fall. So we're not suggesting that you can live a fantasy life just because I think it, it's true. But make no mistake, how you think does lead you into your destiny. And many people don't understand the seriousness of that. For example, Descartes says this, I think, therefore I am. I know he looks like a rock star uh, that's retired and still trying to make money on tour. Have you, have you guys noticed... <laughs> have you guys noticed that these bands never stop yes. people in wheelchair I'm like what the heck man <laughs> seriously anyhow no he was not a rock star. Well, he, was a, he was a philosophical rock star 
And he basically said this, I think, therefore I am. He was searching for the meaning of life. He uh, just couldn't figure things out. He said, what makes me different? Then he came to the conclusion, what makes me what I am is I think, therefore I am. So in other words, I think, therefore I am. That's how I know my life. And so in many ways, people think something. For example, the Bible says in, in Proverbs, for as he thinks in his heart, or he or she thinks in her heart, so is she. So often how you view yourself is what you and I will become. Identity determines our destiny and how we live our lives. If you believe a lie about your identity, for example, maybe you're struggling. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you went to a couple of marriages. Maybe you're the last in your class. Maybe everyone else bypasses you. Maybe your parents never said anything good about you. You were always the one that was never good enough. You feel like a loser inside. Maybe someone said you're a loser and you feel that in you and you start to believe those things. And make no mistake, if you start believing those things, you will drive towards those things. Who are you is a great question. In fact, there was a song written about it. All right, you who people out there. Who? Actually, the who. Who are you? Who, 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 who? I really want to know, right? And uh, who are you? And, and that's a good question. Who am I? Why am I here? Why do I exist? What on earth am I doing here for? And you begin to ask yourself those questions and why and who you are, and you need to find your identity. Now, this is the philosophy we have in our culture today, okay? Here is an axiom or a formula that you and I may think. I do, therefore I am, right? For example, uh, generally speaking, of course, if you go to a men's breakfast, which I encourage you to come, 6 o'clock on Wednesday morning, we have pig sacrifices every Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. We also have a tofu pig for those who don't like meat. Um, but anyhow, when we get together, and when you meet a man, normally, invariably, the man says, what do you do? I'm Plumber Joe. I'm Banker Jeff. Whatever you are, right? We often, men often uh, will, will tell what, they're, what they do for a work. That's what they do. Or they'll talk about what sports team they're a part of, right? This, uh, generally speaking. You go to a woman's brunch or crumpets and tea, whatever the ladies do, and they talk about, they never, you know, don't even know what they do for a living. You find out how many birds they have, how many dogs they have, how many cats, well, not the cats, how many, they, you know, they thought, thinking that out. How, how, how's your family? They often talk about, now I'm not, I'm, I know I'm, I'm uh, oh, come on, you're being generalized. Well, yes, but generally speaking, women tend to talk about relationships and the value of their relationships. That's why men tend to talk about what they do. Both have, we have this, I do, therefore I am. I do, therefore I am. And so that is, this philosophy is something I like to call a disorder. You know what a disorder, someone said you, you have a disorder. You know what disorder means? It's in the wrong order. Order matters. How you think matters. Does behavior matter? Absolutely it matters. But what's more important, and this is the biblical way, I am, therefore I do. So you can chase after behavior for the rest of your life, trying to change your behavior, and maybe that will change my identity. And even Martin Luther King Jr. said something very important. He says, I, I look forward to today. We do not judge a person by their skin color, but by the character who they are. In other words, he got it right. He said, it's not what's on the outside that matters. It's what's on the inside, the character of a person. Now, today, there's a lot of confusion about identity. And the enemy likes to use identity. Identity is an important thing. Do you realize the very first temptation happened? There's two temptations. I'll, I'll show you in a few moments what it was. I do, therefore I am, and I am, therefore I do. If you remember in the garden, Satan said to uh, Eve, he says, did God really say? So we, what the enemy will do is get you to question God and to question yourself. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River in the inauguration of his public ministry, a voice from heaven came out and said, this is my beloved son, who I am well pleased. Immediately after that, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit brought him into the wilderness, and he was there for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the enemy. And the first chronicle or the, uh, the record of it, the very first temptation, Satan came. He went after Jesus' identity. If you 
are the son of God. If you are the son of God. If you are. Why? He goes after the identity because he understands if you can get the identity, you can get the destiny. So, make no mistake, today in our culture and around the world, we see an attack upon identity. It's not from human beings. There are spiritual forces out there that are manipulating things. You grew up. Maybe you heard in fourth grade, oh, you're so stupid. Now you're 55 or 45 or 35 or 25 years old, and you remember that, and that's your identity. One of the pastors I follow, Chris Hodges, talked about his father-in-law. His father-in-law uh, was very smart, very good at, uh, at math and things of that nature. One day in grammar school, that's elementary school, by the way, okay? Uh, he went to, the, he went to the, the board. It's supposed to show your work, but he was so smart. His name is Billy. He was so smart. He went up there and just did it without doing the work. And the teacher says, why'd you do that? Well, I know the answer. And he was kind of fresh. He says, you know what, Billy? You'll never amount to anything. That identification that that teacher told him stuck on him. And for the rest of his life, he started playing in bars, started drinking, carousing, doing all kinds of jobs, nothing worthwhile. Then Exxon opened a plant in the Louisiana area. And so he went for a job. And they gave him one of those placement tests to see where he scored. The guy came back to him and says, uh, sir? He said, I know. I didn't want to have a good... No, you have one of the highest scores we've ever seen. And Billy, you're going to be something. I tell you, you're going to be something. The man said that, it changed his identity and changed the course of his life. He became a church planter, and he became a believer. Watch out what we say to people. I hear a teacher, probably need to remember what she said. If you believe a lie, you know, the Bible says you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And guess who the truth is? Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. So if, a, if the truth sets you free, what holds you in bondage? A lie. So make no mistake, the enemy understands this. Why do you think the very fundamentals of what it means to be a human being are in question right now? It's because, it's not because of those people. No, it's because there's a demonic attack upon our country and our world right now. When you see this fundamental of what is right and what is wrong and what a human being is, and you don't even know how to define it, you know where we are in culture today. And what's helped me out tremendously is this. You know, often we look at people, those people over there, those people over there, and right now we're living in a hateful culture. If you make one mistake, you're damned for good. We have to be different as the church and see people for who they are, not what you see in their behavior completely. Because God saved you while you were still a mess. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We have to understand that. So it, I am, therefore I do. You know what's helped me out recently? I've been doing this lately. Because, you know, ever, like, when someone cuts you off and they use sign language, you know, and you're like, and I, you know, I listen, okay? Let me just tell you, I'm from New York, all right? I'm Italian. My grandfather was in the mob, all right? You know about my Uncle Louie, Okay? So I want to take care of them, right? I'm going to take, uh, make a phone call, take care of it. Uh, no, that's kind of me. That's, that's my old way. But you know what I do now? I'm saying, Lord God, I thank you for that person because this is the truth, everybody. Everyone is going through a battle you know nothing about. Could it be his wife said, I want nothing to do with you? Could it be that his mother is dead? Could it be he lost his job? You don't know what a person, everyone has a battle they're going through. Here's the second thing I've learned. Actually, the first thing is this. That's, a, that's the second one. The first thing is this. Every person is made in the image of God, has intrinsic value on that alone. They're made in the image of God, number one. Number two, they're going through a battle that you know nothing about. And number three, you can learn something from anybody. Somebody is an expert and better than you in a certain area that you're not. Why not try to find what that is? rather than writing them off. And so when we look at society about us, what do we expect? Getting angry at people doesn't help. Going after behavior is, is like a dog chasing its tail. We don't, and listen, there's nothing wrong with behavior, but first before behavior comes, your identity comes first, behavior comes second. Behavior matters. 
but not when it's out of order. And so maybe some of you grew up in a church where it's all about what you can't do. You can't smoke. You can't chew. You can't go with girls who do, right? You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, what church you go? I go to the First Cant. I go to First Cant Church. Where's that? Is it in Canton? Yeah, it's in Canton. <laughs> it's a real place, by the way. I can't do nothing. You can't do this. You can't do that, right? It's, it's ridiculous. And you, it's a never-ending situation. You can never measure up like the heck with Christianity. But Jesus does not say, get your act together. He says, come to me. World religions, the seven pillars of Islam are different religions. You have to do a bunch of stuff. Then maybe you'll be accepted. In Christianity, Christ does it for us already. Now, behaviors need to come after. But that does not define you. For example, here's another one. Maybe some of you have gone through this. Uh, I, I've heard people say this, where they're going through a drug rehab center. They say, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a substance abuse. Uh, I'm a narcotics. I'm addicted to narcotics. Or I'm an alcoholic, and you go to AA. I spent 25 years, and I haven't had a drop in 25 years. So praise God. You know, it's really important that we take ownership of our sin and our problem. Right? That's great. But they'll say this. they say, my name is, my name is Eric, and I'm, an I'm not an alcoholic, okay? But my name is Eric, and I'm, put that on YouTube. You'll be in trouble. My name is Eric, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I, would vent, I would say if you're a child of God, I wouldn't say that. Because my identity is in Christ. Oh, let me say something. My sin does not define me. My Savior defines me. My sin does not define me. My Savior defines me. My past does not define me. My future in Christ defines me. You see, and so what I would say is, yes, I'm a child of God, and I have a propensity and temptations. I struggle with alcohol, but I'm over it. Or I even say this, I am a child of God, and I'm choosing not, I'm choosing to drink and take care, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm choosing not to drink. Well, here's something else. You know what? Here's something else in neuro, neurological studies? This is something interesting. The Bible talks about this, but now science catches up. Do you know, if you start saying, if you start saying to yourself, I'm not going to be negative anymore. I can't be negative. I'm not going to be a negative person. I'm not going to be negative anymore. I'm not going to be negative. Guess what you'll end up doing? You'll be negative. What you have to do is go after the source. I'm a positive person. I'm a smart person. Oh, I knew I had trouble with porn. No, I have self-control in Jesus' name. I'm sober-minded, right? I'm a good husband. Start telling us, if you say you're a bad husband, you start driving towards that. Well, you know, I, I, you know, stupid me. Don't say stuff like that. Because your mind, your subconscious doesn't know any. This is science and this is the Bible. By the way, all truth, God's truth. Remember I told you that? So your identity, the enemy wants to feed you lies. So what we have to do is get you brainwashed with the truth. Right? So I am, therefore I do. You go after behavior, you'll be spending the rest of your life. It's never, I mean, I don't want to go to church today. What'd you learn? Well, I learned I'm not supposed to tell tattletales. I learned I'm not supposed to do this. I learned I'm not supposed to. That's exhausting. I can't, I can't do it. If that's what church is, I'm quitting. In fact, can I be transparent with you for a few moments? There was a time I lived in the Bible Belt. I wanted, I, I wanted to rebel against the church because the church was so legalistic. They all had their stuff together. There's a bunch of angry. I'm, I'm, I'm just being truthful with it. That's what I felt like. They all had the answers. Hypocrisy. And, and so I got tired of it. And then I realized that I was a hypocrite too. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm part of it. So I do, therefore I am. I am, therefore I do. Our problem is we often go after the behavior rather than the core of our identity. And maybe you're thinking, what is my identity? How many children do I have? Am I married or, or, or am I married or am I divorced, right? How about this? This just happened. Everyone's at the prom. I didn't go to the prom. I look at that prom dress. Look what they got it. Looks like they got it at the. Wow, I got mine at the. I got mine at the uh, Halloween costume outfit. Look what they're wearing. Or maybe this person's with this person, and you feel like I'm a loser. I don't have anybody. And then you look on Facebook or I forget Facebook for, for old people, but Instagram and Snapchat, and all these people look beautiful. They look fantastic. They have boyfriend and girlfriends. They're going to, you know, they got a complete full ride to Yale. They're playing football. I mean, it's, everything's going amazing. You're like, I'm a loser. 
and you start feeling like, I, I don't measure up, I'm not good enough. Or someone, their kids are doing amazing. You know, they come to church on Sunday, they pull up in an SUV, all eight kids come out, all of them, they march like ducks into the, the, the woman looks like she got off the Glamour magazine, the guy's got buff, he's got pectorals, and, and a six pack, he's coming in with a tight shirt, looks like Tim Tebow, and, and he's walking in, short, full head of hair, and, and you're sitting there, and you're, you're, you're barely moving, you're like this, and your kids are crying, you're screaming, you just yell at your wife, you slap your child, and you come into church. And then, you find out that that guy is going through a divorce. Oh, isn't that terrible? <laughs> I knew it. And you feel good about it. Why? Because you're comparing yourself to them. I wanted to share a story with you, something that happened to me. A little while ago, when I was about uh, 20, 21, 22 years ago, uh, my wife and I, we were working at Bethel Christian Church and with Pastor Joe Timberlake, and uh, I was leading worship there, and I was doing the young adults. I loved it. It was a great time. My wife and I were newly married, and uh, I loved it. I loved worship. I let, used to lead worship here for 13 years. And, and what happened was uh, one of the worship leaders left because there was a... How many people know stuff happens in churches, right? There was a problem, you know. And there was a little bit... A bunch of folks left the church and this and the other. So I was still in charge. So the pastor said to me, hey, uh, the other guy wanted to leave too. He had two worship leaders and me. And I was going to take over. But the other worship leader was going to leave because he felt like I should be me. So he said, hey, I want you to step down and just help. I'm not going to say his name. i say his name is Jack. I said, okay, no problem. <laughs> that morning, if you were to ask me, Pastor, you, I love leading worship. I do it for God. I care about God. I love God. Uh, you know, it's all about Jesus, man. Well, it's all about Jesus. So I go to bed that night, about 2 o'clock or so in the morning. Why is it always 2 o'clock in the morning? I don't know. About 2 or 3 in the morning, I wake up in a cold sweat, and I have anxiety anger and frustration all combined. I never had this, this is a weird experience. I was like, my heart was racing. It's like I had a nightmare. And I woke up, oh, um, honey, what's going on with me? What's the matter? I don't know. I, I feel weird. I, I, something's wrong with me. What's, what's wrong with me? What's going on? I keep thinking about the worship team. What, what do I? And then I, and I asked my wife, oh, pray for me, pray for me. She started praying for me. And then I started, I calmed myself down. When I woke up, I'm like, what the heck? What's bothering me? The worship team. I asked the Lord, Lord, show me. And I asked my wife, and Sandra and I were talking back and forth, and I realized I was anxious and frustrated about the worship. You know why? Because my identity was wrapped up on me being a worship leader, not a child of God. Now, if you were to ask me that morning, I'd say, oh, I'm for God. So what happened was it was the anxiety, it was the frustration, it revealed my heart, and I suspect Many of us struggle with that. Is there a landmine in your mind, in your life, that if someone touched, oh, no. And we had a situation in the past, not here, where everyone got involved with titles. Oh, I'm a pastor of this. I'm an apostle. I'm an elder. I'm this and the other. Everyone's about these titles. You know the problem with titles? You get entitled. That's why I say, that's why I say my name is Eric, and I'm the pastor of the church. Okay? You can't do that, pastor. You're pastor Eric. No, I'm, my name's Eric. I'm the pastor of the church. You can call me pastor Eric. That's fine. But I'm first. So what happens is we start feeling entitled. And my identity was wrapped up in me being a worship. I had no idea that was a problem until it was taken from me. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you, maybe you are struggling at work. Maybe you're struggling at home. Maybe you're struggling because someone is rising up in the ranks at work and you're afraid if they get that position, then your identity shot. So I'm going to subconsciously sabotage what they're doing. Now, that doesn't happen to anyone here, does it? Now, why am I sharing this for? Because I want, I want to be real with you, right? If you want a pastor that has all his stuff together, this is not the place. I'm just being honest with you. Okay, I got stuff going on in my life. I'm wanted in three counties. And <laughs> just kidding. I'm not wanted in three counties. But I, I want to be real with you. This is just how that happens. We don't, we're not even aware of it. See, our problem is we often go after our behavior rather than the core of our identity. You see, there's two, the two most important thoughts that you can think about at any given time. The two most important thoughts that you can think about at any given time are the following. Okay? Is this. What you think, what you think about God. And here's the second one, what you think about yourself. What you think about God and what you think about yourself will determine the course of your life. What happens if you don't think about God? Hence, why do you think we're having shootings every other week? If there's no God, if there's no heaven, if there's no hell, 
if, there's, if, if we're just a vapor and we're gone and we never come back, then what difference does it really make? And the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And when the fear of God leaves a nation or respect of God leaves a nation, this is why we see what's going on today. So do we yell at those people? No, we help people come to know Christ. So this is what we see happening. What we think about God is really important. Many of you think God is an evil taskmaster. He's an angry, cantankerous old man that you can never satisfy. You're never good enough. I just woke you up. I did that on purpose. <laughs> or is he a loving, or is he just an out-to-lunch, senile old man? No. God is a loving, compassionate, he's fierce, he's powerful, and he's loving at the same time. And so we need to see God in the right way. So, what we think about God and what we think about ourselves, those are the two most important thoughts you can have at any given moment. How do you know about yourself? You're never going to know yourself until you know God. Really. You're not really going to know yourself until you know God. You see, we cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. God is your designer. God is the one that made you. And the Bible says, as, uh, the Bible says his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Do you realize God said, let there be, and even now, 55 billion light years away, the, the universe is still expanding, and it's from what he said. God's ways are so much higher and so much greater, and we need to submit ourselves to God, and God is all truth all the time, right? So if we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God, and we must think, change what we think about ourselves and put it in the right context. The book of Ephesians will help us with this. The book of Ephesians. Your identity leads to your destiny. Your identity leads to your destiny. You want to change your destiny? Change the way you think. And that will change your destiny. Especially when you put the truth of God. Not just good, nice thinking that you can have without God. So, how God defines me is who I am. How God defines me is who I am. How, what does God say about you? Well, I'm so glad you asked. If you've given your life to Christ, by the way, uh, it says all have sinned, all have sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous, no, not one. None of us are. But God died for us through Jesus Christ, right? So this is the truth. We're all, we're all a hot mess. We are. But with Christ, there's new beginnings. So if you give yourself to Christ, therefore, if anyone, look at your neighbor, say, you're an anyone. Tell your neighbor, I'm a someone. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone is in church, if anyone listens to Caleb and eats Chick-fil-A, <laughs> and where's a retin? No. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in what? Christ. Christ. He is a what? New creation, a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Your past does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Let me say it again. Your past does not define you. Your Savior defines you. Yes, you may be absent money. So let's drive to what God would call us to be and to do. Now, we're going to look here. We're going to take a little drive-by for a quick moment. We're not going to be able to dissect it much deeper than this. But the Apostle Paul writes the book of Ephesians. If you want to see the history of Ephesians, you go to Acts chapter 19. It describes what Paul went through, how he went to this pagan town, and how he set up a, uh, a church there. And he was there for two and a half to three years. We're going to get to more next week about that. He had a school in Tyrannius. It was a school he began. And then for two and a half to three years, he trained believers. And believers went from Ephesus, which is modern-day Turkey, all around by the Adrian Sea, right over in that area, okay? And it was one of the crown jewels of the Roman Empire at the time. It, was one, it had one of the seven wonders of the world. It had, um, it had a temple to the god Diane or Artemis is the uh, temple and it was about two football fields full of pillars and a top it was the largest building in the world it was beautiful it was an epicenter of culture and religion it was a banking center if you call it banking in those days it had a, it had a uh, man-made port and so you could bring your ships there you could go across and you could take roads and go all around the world it was a great trading place it was like new york city it was, it was like going to a place where a metropolitan, where all culture is. The 
Apostle Paul planted himself there in the epicenter of culture and in the epicenter of hedonism. At this temple, they had temple prostitutes. They worshiped false gods. They had witchcraft. All the, you think it's bad now. It was a lot worse then. It was a lot worse then. It was a horrible place in regards to morality. And the Apostle Paul stayed there. And eventually he got arrested. And there's a, it's a cool story. I don't have time to tell you all the story right now. But it was the epicenter of what was going on. And from, the, from that place, they, that's why it's important to get good doctrine, doctrine and theology. And that's what he did. He taught them. In fact, uh, one of our, Rick Totten is doing a phenomenal job doing a book study on Ephesians. How many is going to that? Anyone? Yeah, good, right? Yep. How many is? I just said that. How many is? My Long Island's coming out of me. Okay. Paul and the Apostle. So what happened was the Apostle Paul was there for about three years. And then what happened was he left. And then he got, he basically, a, a number of years later, he was arrested. And he was under house arrest, chained to a guard. And he was dictating this letter to the church in Ephesus, the one he began and started a number of years earlier. He put Timothy, his protege, in charge of the church. Later on, uh, John, the apostle, came to Ephesus with Mary, the mother of Jesus. We found that out from another historical document. Eusebius, uh, if I say his name correctly, I'm not good at my Greek. I apologize. So anyhow, this is kind of that was going on in the city. So this was a very, very metropolitan, a cultural center. And in the middle of this, he's going to tell the uh, Christians who they are. Now, we're not going to be able to break it down too much, but what we are going to do, we're going to take a drive through it real quick, and then we're going to end, okay? You track with me? So you guys can read this, by the way. Go home and read it. I've read it five times in the last couple of days. It's easy. It takes 15 minutes. So here we go. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in, the, in Christ Jesus, grace <clears throat> to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You see how it describes who you are in Christ? Powerful. That we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight." making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in the heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purposes, purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were in the, excuse me, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a long Greek sentence. It's, it's really not very grammatically correct in the Greek. But the Apostle Paul packs in our identity in Christ. We're going to unpack a little bit of that next week in a practical manner. We don't have time, but we're going to talk about who you are. We're going to define who you are. If you know who you are and whose you are, and you have the right idea of yourself, and you have the right idea of God, watch out world. We need to be a people that know who God is and know who we are, and as a result, we can change the world. Now, just to review, the two most important thoughts we have that shape our lives is this, what we think about God and what we think about ourselves. I like what Tim Keller said. He said this, religion, my identity is built on being a good person. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. A never ending. Aren't you tired? I'm tired of going to church finding what, what I'm doing wrong now. So I'm just telling you, if you ever feel that when you come here, it's not the right thing. What it's about is this. I want to be more surrendered to Christ. 
I want to love God more. When I love God more, I'm going to do the right things naturally. Does behavior merit matter? Absolutely. If I am doing things that are bad and polluting, it's going to pollute me. But never, never, and I say this again, never put behavior before your identity in Christ. Because otherwise we start criticizing everybody and start judging everybody. Because, listen, everybody, we're all hypocrites. Just because I don't struggle with something else, and you may struggle with something else. And so I, 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 don't, I don't want us to ever become a church where we're legalistic. I don't want to sit there judging someone based upon what they wear or what they don't wear or, you know, what, when you, I don't want to sit there and judge people about that. I'm not about that, and neither is God. We want to look at people's behavior. Does behavior matter? Yes, behavior matters. But let's not go past the most important. The most important is the heart of the person. Are they giving themselves to life? I did not say behavior did not matter. I said going after behavior before identity in Christ is a disorder. God does not want us to be a church that's disordered. He wants us to be a church that's ordered, where it's first in Christ, loving God, surrendering to him. Behavior follows. Behavior matters, but not at the expense of your identity in Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, so religion, my identity is built on being a good person. Gospel, good news, my identity is not built on my record of my performance, but on Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you so much today, Lord, that you are a good God, a loving God, a powerful God. And I thank you, Father. I just pray right now that you would erase from us this performance mentality as if we could please you without you. Lord, we recognize, it says in the scriptures, God, that all the right things we do are nothing but filthy rags. It's only by you and through you and by you and for you that we have any chance at all. Lord, I pray right now that you begin to release us from guilt and condemnation. And Father, we start believing what you say about us, not our past, not what other people have said about us. In Jesus' name. I want to conclude with two more things. Here's one of the themes of this, of this whole book. For we are his what? Workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah, we're created for good works. But we are his workmanship created for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when you know your workmanship, then you can start doing the purposes of God. When you know who you are, you can become who you are. And you, if you're giving your life to Christ, you are a, new, you are a child of God. You have intrinsic value to him. You have a purpose and a plan. God loves you where you are. He's got good plans for you. He's not asking you to be anyone else but what he's created you to be. He's asking you to be a, an image of him, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads one more time. I'm going to ask you this question. How are you with Jesus? If you were to die today, do you absolutely positively know you go to heaven? If your answer is, well, I'm a pretty good person, doesn't cut it. The Bible says all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. And there's only one way we can be saved. It's by the name of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus paid the price you and I can't pay. Have you given your life to Jesus? It's not enough just to believe in Jesus. That's important. But the Bible even says that the enemy, Satan, believes in Jesus. It's not just believing in Jesus. That's a, that's a component. But you must be willing to surrender your life and determine you're not God and God is. And so I'm going to pray a prayer in a few moments. Maybe, you're, maybe you've gone to church all your life, but you've never completely given your life to Christ. Today is the day. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. How many of you would say, Pastor, I used to walk with God. I'm not walking anymore, but I want to. I've never given my life to Christ, but today I want to give my life to Christ for the first time. I want to renew my commitment. Real, we had several in the last couple. So anyone, just raise your hand. Let me know so I can see that. If just help you, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else this morning? Thank you, sweetheart. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray this prayer in our hearts. Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you today to forgive me of all the things I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And today, I choose to step down from being in charge of my life. I declare you are God and I am not. I submit my life to you. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name.